We, every year, for many years, we've done a conference in the UK, uh, most recent last number of years in Nottingham, the Trent Vineyard. And we were worshipping shortly after Marcus embarked upon this uh, activity. He, he was... Korea. He, Korea, thank you. That's what I'm looking for. Uh, <laughs> we were worshipping together at the conference and at one point, I didn't realize it, but a man called Sean Byrne was standing next to me. Uh, Sean and Debbie, if you know them, lead the vineyard in Dublin, in Ireland. And he has a wicked sense of humor, among other things. And he wrote, he wrote to me a week later after the conference. He said, uh, John, thank you so much. It was a wonderful conference and the Lord blessed us and it was a great success. Love from Sean and Debbie. P.S. I stood next to John during worship. Full stop. Marcus gets his singing voice from Eleanor. <laughs> <laughs> So that's the reason you don't want me to sing. <laughs> now look, um, if you have a Bible, would you like to turn to Paul's first letter to Timothy? We're coming into one Timothy chapter. We're coming into land on uh, this mini series that. Uh, you have endured these last three days that Ellen and I have done. Um, and I want to pick up from where I left off by turning you to First Timothy chapter 1 and verse 11. Where Paul, writing to Timothy, has this little phrase. He talks about the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which he, God, entrusted to me, Paul. I love this phrase, the glorious gospel of the blessed God. And if you were here on Monday morning, you will have heard me talk about the good news, and we extracted it from Paul's um, sermon in Athens, in Acts, recorded in Acts chapter 17. When uh, uh, we were talking about marriage and so on yesterday, and I think at the Q&A, if you were here at the Q&A, they asked Dave and Colleen and Ellen and me, Ellen and me how we met. Um, and when we got decided eventually, we were secretly engaged for how many years? Nearly four. Nearly four years, for a very variety of reasons. It took me a long time to persuade her that this would be a very good thing to do, to marry me. <laughs> and eventually, when we did get engaged 40-something years ago, we went to a jeweler's shop in Salisbury, which is a country town in Wiltshire. And I distinctly remember that this was in order to buy an engagement ring, of course. And I distinctly remember that the, the jeweler had a, in those days, had a large glass cabinet with a glass top, you know, and you could peer at all the impossibly expensive rings. And I remember what he actually did was he went to the back and he got a black piece of velvet and he laid it out on the the top of the glass cabinet. And then, one by one, he produced from inside the cabinet a number of different rings uh, with which to, uh, in order to display his magnificent selection. And of course, uh, you can imagine the, the contrast with the dark background made the diamonds glitter all the more spectacularly. And there is a sense in which when Paul used the phrase that was up there a moment ago, the glorious gospel of Jesus, there's a sense in which 
Paul, uh, when he comes to write to the Tim- Timothy, he spreads out the black background of what is going on in order that the gospel, the good news, might sparkle all the more brilliantly. That really is the theme of this letter he writes uh, uh, to Timothy. In the 16th century, there was a man by the name of William Tyndall. Uh, He was the First, I, he was the first person to translate the Bible from its original languages, Greek and Hebrew, into English. This was only 70 or 80 years after the invention of the printing press, so he moved pretty rapidly to take advantage of this new technology. And, um, I mean, he got into a lot of trouble and it was finally executed because having the, the Bible in a language that the people would understand was seen as hugely threatening politically. Isn't that interesting? They preferred to keep it in Latin because it would, it would have less impact on the nation. And he was eventually executed on account of, of spreading dissension because he translated the Bible into English. Isn't that extraordinary? Anyhow, he said this of the gospel, of this word, evangelion is the word in the original language, in the Greek language. It is a Greek word, and it signifies good, merry, glad, and joyful tidings. Good, merry, glad, and joyful tidings that maketh a man's heart glad and maketh him sing, dance, and leap for joy. So we probably ought to show that video clip of Dave dancing at the (laughs) South African Vineyard Leaders Conference. I mean, that'll go down as a classic, won't it? (laughs) In the archives of the Global Vineyard. But don't you love it? Here he's saying this word, evangelion, the gospel, the good news, maketh a man's heart glad and maketh him sing, dance, and leap for joy. It's the the word evangelion is the word that we get in the English language, evangelical which is broadly speaking how in the vineyard we define ourselves. By by which I mean, now, the the term evangelical, or in um, some some circles they talk about conservative evangelical as as distinct from liberal ones. But some people these days are a little uncomfortable with the term uh, evangelical, partly I think because in certain parts of the world, Uh, that term has become linked with um, um, distinctly right-wing politics, uh, particularly in the United States. But the term itself, in its original form, I think is a very helpful and accurate description of who we are. Even if if, if we have to use shorthand, and we do sometimes have to use shorthand, uh, we can't go far wrong by describing ourselves as evangelicals. John Wimber often used to say, he, um, I'm a conservative evangelical, he said. Uh, and he said, I'm an evangelical who believes in and tries to function in the gifts, all the gifts of the Holy Spirit, as distinct from a conservative evangelical who doesn't. Which was a helpful d- distinction. So let's look at a, a little bit more at what Timothy is saying to us about the gospel and particularly about the, what a wonderful church should look like. Chapter 1, let, let's read it. Chapter 1, and we'll start at 
verse 3. This is Paul writing to Timothy. As I urged you when I went into Macedonia, stay there in Ephesus so that you may command certain persons not to teach false doctrines any longer or to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies. In other words, stuff. You remember we talked about the main and the plain? Well, they were, they were concentrating on whatever the opposite is of the main and the plain, the trivial and the unimportant. That's what they were doing with these myths and endless genealogies. Such things, he writes, promote controversial speculations rather than advancing God's work, which is by faith. The goal of this command, he says, is love, which comes from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Some have departed from these and have turned to meaningless talk. They want to be teachers of the law, but they don't know what they're talking about or what they so confidently affirm. We know that the law is good if one uses it properly. We also know that the law is not made for the righteous, but for lawbreakers and rebels, the ungodly and sinful, the unholy and the irreligious, those who kill their fathers and mothers for murderers, for those who are sexually immoral, for those who are practicing homosexuality, for slave traders and liars and perjurers. That's the black background I was talking about. And he says, standing against that background. And he says, whatever else is contrary to the sound doctrine that conforms to the gospel concerning the glory of the blessed God, which he has entrusted to me. And one of the themes that emerges very strongly in Paul's first letter is that um, there were false teachers. You notice in verse 7 he talks about uh, teachers of the law who are in fact, in verse 3, teaching false doctrines. So he's setting the scene. So what Timothy is saying, Timothy was left in Ephesus to stem this tide. This, this was going on. This false teaching was beginning to gain some traction in the church in Ephesus. And so Paul left Timothy there in order to sort it out. And there's an urgency to it. I, I, I urge you to do this. I command you to do this. You see in verse uh, 3, you may command certain persons not to teach false doctrines any longer. Uh, you, you may know that um, this first letter to Timothy, um, for many years, people assumed, many scholars assumed that it was a handbook for church order. In other words, how you govern churches and oversee them. But people thought that what Paul was doing to Timothy was writing him, giving him a handbook on how to organize the church. The funny thing is that down through church history, the entire spectrum of the body of Christ have gone to 1 Timothy in order to justify their own particular theory of government. So you have on the one hand what you might call the hierarchical um, Episcopal leadership of the Catholic Church on the one hand. Then somewhere in the middle you have the sort of quasi-democratic Presbyterians, you know, a few centuries later. And then a little more recently than that, in the previous century, you had the what you might call the extreme congregationalism of the Plymouth Brethren or the Christian Brethren, if you heard them. So, I mean, literally, in, in terms of how you lead churches and govern churches, polar opposites. And in some cases, they went to war with each other. <laughs> and the funny thing is, they all use precisely the same texts in this book. So, as Gordon Fee comments, he, he says, they seem to use these texts a bit like a drunk 
uses a lamppost <laughs> for support rather than, rather than illumination. And uh, Gordon Fee goes on, if Paul intended the purpose of this letter to be that of definitively setting the church in good order, we can only say that he failed miserably. <laughs> so that, out goes that theory. What it seems to be that Paul is dealing with here is people who've crept into the church with what he calls here false teaching, and he, as I say, he unpacked it, false doctrines. And that's what he seems to be talking about. Now, it's funny, isn't it? Um, in the vineyard, um, it's not unusual to find people who are somewhat dismissive of the whole idea of doctrine. Have you come across that? It's like, the word has, has a sense of sort of sterile intellectualism. Oh, it's, it, it's academic, they say, or it's boring, or it's divisive, they complain. So if you want to read a Christian book, don't, don't read a book on doctrine. No, 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 don't do that. Read something far more exciting. And if you want to find a good church, make sure you choose one where the worship lasts way longer than the sermon. Uh, but all one can say is that that wasn't how Paul saw it. And if Timothy was going to set the rest of his congregation a good example, says Paul, you mustn't see it like that either. So, the, there are a number of different themes that emerge from Paul's first letter to Timothy, and of course I haven't got time to deal with anything like all of them, but one that does stand out very strongly, and I want to draw your attention to, is what he calls in different places, sound doctrine. Sound doctrine. And, and his point is that doctrine matters. And it matters because of this, that what we believe ultimately dictates, de determines how we behave. Or you could put it like this, our creed is the seedbed of our conduct. You see, the false teachers in, in here in, uh, that were troubling the church with Ephesus that he refers to in these opening verses, Sp specifically, it seems that their error was lying in the area of Christian ethics. If you turn over to chapter 4, let me just, because you might ask, well, what was the particular error? Well, the particular error, it seems that they were talking about, were these, um, the, the, what do they call them? These, uh, chapter four, holding out promise, having nothing to do with godless myths, again, he uses that word, and old wives' tales. Rather, he says, train yourselves to be godly. What if you just look a few verses, he says, such teachings, and he's talking about the false teaching, such teaching come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared with a hot iron. They forbid people to marry and order them to abstain from certain foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and who know the truth. For everything God created is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving. So what they were saying, some of these false teachers, was the certain food you can't touch. And my guess is, what would you think these days, what would they pick on? They'd pick on chocolate, wouldn't they? 
Yeah, and I'm sure they'd p p pick on a decent wine. And I mean, basically anything that you and I enjoy, they'd slap a label on, wouldn't it, saying that's prohibited. And they were also forbidding people to marry. They forbade people to marry. And in both instances, they were dictating behavior. You shouldn't do this, you shouldn't eat that, you shouldn't marry and, you know, everything else that goes with marriage. But of course, we can't talk about it, can we, because we're Christians. But if we were to talk about it, I'm talking about sex. <laughs> do you see? So they were talking about behavior. But if you look closely, the real issue is the doctrine underneath it, the truth under it. Because, you see, they were saying these things are bad. Don't touch them. Whereas Paul counters here by saying, hang on, no, no, no. These things, God twice, he says, God created them. So by definition, they can't be bad. Look in verse, this is chapter 4, verse 3. God created to be received with thanksgiving. So God created these things. God created delicious food. God created marriage and all that goes with it. You see, and therefore it's something to be enjoyed. <laughs> the funny thing is, isn't it? These, these um, strange false teachers, teachers were saying, well, marry if you must, but don't have sex. Do you see, and elsewhere in the Bible, turn, the teaching of Paul is it turns out exactly on its head, 180 degrees. Because the Bible teaches that if you're married, then you're, don't stop having sex. The false teachers will say, stop it. Paul was saying, keep at it. Uh, yes, stop if you must. Stop to fast and to pray. But then he specifically says, get back to it quickly once you finish fasting and praying. Well, he, was, he was a sensible gentleman. He was a realist, wasn't he? But my point is, you see, that the, mis the, the mistake here was a theological one, not an ethical one. Do you see that? They were saying something was bad, and Paul said, no, 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 these things are good. So don't abstain from them. Make sense? The fundamental problem was not an ethical one, it was a theological one. And I, 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 all I'm trying to do here, you say, well, John, where on earth are you going with this? Very good question. Um, <laughs> where I'm going with this is I, with the direction of a healthy, wonderful church, and the direction we're heading, and the direction this movement is heading, and the direction the Vineyard Global is heading over the next 20, 40, 50, 100 years. One of the things we have got to keep an eye on and must not disdain is what you would call, what Paul would call, sound doctrine. So I, I urge you, we were praying the night before last, I think it was, for some of the people who are, who are teachers of the scriptures. And that would include, and it did include, some people who are giving their lives to what we would call academic theology. And we need that. We need people to help us to understand the truth and to apply it as culture shifts and changes and does what culture does. We need, to take the, we need people who can help us take the eternal truths and apply them to these different situations in order that we may maintain sound doctrine and not go off the rails. Do you know that um, in the fight in the United States Treasury, it runs an organization called the FBI. And the, in their fight against counterfeit currency, young trainees from the FBI were sent to work at the Treasury. And to their surprise, when they got there, very little attention was given to fake uh, currency dollar bills, no? They spent most of their time studying genuine dollar bills 
in the greatest of detail, the paper, the ink, the watermarks, and so on and so forth. And, and as I say, very little time at all examining forgeries. And when they asked their instructor why this was, the instructor replied, the more you know the real thing, the more quickly you'll recognize the fake. And so, in our ongoing study of the scriptures, that'll help us enormously. As we understand and grasp the gospel and sound doctrine. So, one theme is sound doctrine that emerges. A second theme is what I call godly character. And I want you to look to the chapter three. Godly character, chapter three. Let me read it to you. Here is a trustworthy saying. It's funny, isn't it, when Paul puts that in. Here's a trustworthy saying. Well, does that imply, what does that imply about all the rest? A little dodgy? No, I don't think so. I think he's just saying this is particularly worth you paying attention to. Whoever aspires to be an overseer desires a noble task. Now, basically, he's talking about, he's talking about leadership here. And uh, the precise meaning of the word overseer, again, has been debated, but you know, for, for today's, this morning's purposes, let's talk about leadership. You, know, when you say, hang on, John, this is not a leadership conference, it's a summer camp. Yes, I know that, yeah, I'm fully aware of that. But my point is that it does talk about, um, it does talk about whoever aspires to be. So there are some of you here who would never describe yourselves as leaders. But more than once you thought to yourself or you maybe you felt the Lord say to you, do you know, I wonder, I wonder if God's calling me to that. So let me address it. Personally, I, I, I think it, I don't think we ought to confine teaching on the subject of leadership just to gatherings of leaders. Personally, I think that's a mistake. I think it's, it's healthy and good for the whole of the, the body of Christ to hear about teaching on leadership because it helps, it, it gives a context, it gives an understanding. It underlines the importance of this gift that God has given to the church that we call leadership or oversight or whatever you want to call it. So it may be you're sitting here and, oh, I don't know, you regularly, do, do you have Starbucks in this part of the world? Was that a deep insult to the Scandinavian people? You do have Starbucks. You know, you're a student and you spend a lot of time in Starbucks actually. And you have a couple of friends who are very interested in talking about Christianity. And so you gather together and you meet at Starbucks once a week and you consume a large quantity of coffee and you spend most of the t your time answering their questions. Don't look now, but that's leadership. Well, you say, I'm not a leader. Well, not, it depends what you mean. You are, in that you, you're influencing a couple of people. You see, leadership comes in all shapes and sizes. And for those who are aspiring to leadership, this is a classic text that Paul has given us. It's incredibly helpful. Verse 2. Now, the overseer is to be above reproach. These are, in a sense, a list of criteria. The sorts of things Paul says we're looking for in those who are leadership. So we're looking for this in people who are already leaders. We're also holding this out as a model, as an example, as a standard, as a set of expectations for any of you here that aspire to be leaders and will be leaders in the future. Now, the overseer is to be above reproach, faithful to his wife, if he's married, temperate, self-controlled, 
respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him, and he must do so in a manner worthy of full respect. Because if anyone doesn't know how to manage his own family, how on earth can he take care of God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. He must also have a good reputation with outsiders so that he will not fall into, the, fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. So here he's saying, um, he begins, verse 2, the overseer is to be above reproach. That's verse 2. And then if you just Shoot down to verse 7. He must also have a good reputation with outsiders. Think of those two statements, one in verse 2 and the other in verse 7. Think of them like bookends on a bookshelf. Because in a sense, when he says, he, Paul says, um, a, a, an overseer is to be above reproach, in a sense, that's his summary. And the, the, the various specific instructions that he writes in verses, the rest of verse 2, 3, 4, and 5, are basically unpacking what it means to be above reproach. And then he sums it up at the end by saying all these things should contribute to the fact that, that this person must have a good reputation with outsiders. A true overseer, it must be the type of person whose personal behavior will counter that of the false teachers, do you see, that he's been talking about in the text, and help the church maintain its credibility. And what is so damaging is when leaders crash, is that it, it's not only a tragedy for them and their families often, but also it damages the credibility of the church and the, the rest of the body of Christ. So, so above reproach, what's he getting at? That basically nobody has anything legitimate against you. St. John Chrysostom wrote, every virtue is implied in this word, above reproach. Husband of one wife. By that I think he's getting at if a leader or an overseer is married, that they should be steady and stable as well as monogamous. And if, indeed, if difficulties arise in marriage, as they do, uh, as we all experience, those of us married, to dig in and to fight to save it and to preserve it. So healthy, strong marriages, are, I think, is the underlying theme of what he said, temperate, not given to extremes. Self-control, by that I think he means reflective, not impulsive. We sometimes describe wisdom, don't we, that, uh, which is knowledge that's been applied. Uh, Wimber had written in the front, the, do you call it the flyleaf? Of his, of his Bible, and I saw it once, he had the word restraint written to remind him, but not once, but three times. Restraint, restraint, restraint. And he had discovered that the more he went on, the older he got as a leader, the more he needed to be self-controlled and to be restrained. Um, Respectable. I, I don't think. I don't think there. Paul is talking about middle class uptightness. I think he's by respectable. I think we could use the word integrity. I think that's the the true meaning of the word. A person who could be can be trusted and walks in honesty. Um, 
the integ integrity means they're integrated. In other words, what they say and what they do interlock as opposed to there being a big discrepancy between the two. Hospitable. Somebody who loves people. Pe uh, the, uh, they're open to showing love and affection for all people. Very important. The ability to teach. I never see must be a good teacher and learner. You will have noticed already that all these attributes that are listed are about character. This is the one exception. It's talking about gifting. People who are able to look for people. Let me speak to those of you who are pastors. Look for people in your church, in your congregation, who are good at explaining things. People who are good at, particularly for young people or to younger Christians, are able to take this book and to unpack it and to make it palatable and understandable to people. Carrying on to verse 3, much wine, not given to much wine. Again, the point he's making here is that joy comes from Jesus, not from substances. That's really the point he's making. Not violent. Again, not ruled by emotions. You know, watch how, those of you who are younger, watch how older men or women handle volatile situations. It can be very instructive. Over the years, I've learned a lot just by watching how these things are handled. Gentle. Someone, I, to me, gentleness speaks of security, an internal security. They've, they've, they've no need to prove anything. They've no need to persuade you that they are a leader and they're going to lead you. When people start doing that and, you know, do what I tell you because I'm your leader, you, all your alarm bells ought to ring. No, no. What is... So th these are the sorts of things we must um, work on. These are the sorts of things we must hold one another to account on. The, the, these are very, very important in the whole business of leading a church that is going to be full of stability and health. What is the, what is the assumption here? What assumption is Paul making when he gives this, this list of criteria for leaders? I think the underlying assumption is that somebody is going to scrutinize. So, so Paul gives us a list. Here, here are the standards. Here, here are the expectations of leaders. Well, now, who is going to... How is that going to be matched and married to the characters of individual leaders? Myself included. Answer... Somebody has to scrutinize me. I imagine as you're sitting there and listening to Ellen and me and indeed others up here speaking, people who are leaders of one sort or another, your ass assumption is, isn't it, that somebody has scrutinized me. You may not have done it. Uh, that doesn't matter, but somebody has. I mean, the last thing you'd want is anybody leading you who was completely, as it were, unexamined and unscrutinized, isn't it? I mean, you'd never join a church, would you? If you thought this leader was, you know, there's none of the Pauline biblical criteria being applied to, you know, is there a checklist? <laughs> Do you see my point? And sometimes, my observation is sometimes with leaders, when they do get into trouble with any one of these issues, 
and we address it. The, their response is to turn around and say, how, how dare you? This is private. This is between me and the Lord. How dare you address this? Who do you think you are? To, to which our reply is, somebody's got to. Somebody's got to do this job. And you, you, want, you want people, this is my point, you want people to scrutinize you. You really do. It's very, very helpful to, to have your loving critics. You know, every now and then in leadership, I'm sure you do the same. I'm sure you do it in business quite as much in the church. We have, we'll do a 360 assessment. And you've got various people, different people, who are, are you, with different relationships to, to a leader, will give their own feedback about the leader. Very helpful. Sometimes it hurts a little bit, but that's no bad thing. But healthy churches have a, have a, a culture, an expectation, an understanding that we'll hold one another to account and we'll conform to these things. And believe me, it's when these things go wrong that that's, uh, it's usually because people haven't been scrutinized properly and carefully enough and that leads to damage. So, sound doctrine and godly character. These are fundamental. So no wonder that Paul says, train yourself to be godly. And he goes on to say in chapter 4, verse 12, set an example. Part of, a big part of what leadership is about is set an example, even for the list of things we've just talked about, is to have somebody who is actually not just talking about it, but actually doing it, or actually demonstrating these very things in their lives is enormously helpful. And, and as Paul says, set an example for the believers in godliness. This is chapter 4 and verse 12. In godliness, in speech, in life, in love, in faith, and in purity. Set an example. Set an example. If leadership is about anything, it's about that. And the people said, Amen. Amen. I believe it's time for coffee.